Our next speaker is a local man, Brendan Matthews. His talk is called Balbriggan 1920, The Rise and Fall of a Thriving Community. Brendan Matthews is an independent historian with a specialty focusing on community history research and all that that entails. Settlement, transport, industry, health, education, justice, crime, etc. And the establishment, progression, and our decline of communities over periods of time. You're very welcome, Brendan. Thanks very much, Brian. And good afternoon to everybody that's here. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Killian for contacting me in relation to today. And it is a, it's an honor to be here, uh, not least of getting that wonderful gift couple of minutes ago without even speaking, that's something to be treasured for sure. Uh, and I, I thank you deeply for that. That's probably one, if not the best, uh, gifts that I've received as a community historian, something that will definitely be treasured and, and hopefully passed on for years and years to come uh, without seeing the light of eBay ever. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so to, to go back to the late 1990s, again, I think Jim Walsh may have touched on this already this morning, but to go back to the late 1990s, there was a house being demolished uh, in Stamullen village. In the, it had gone to rack and ruin throughout the 1990s, owned by a Church of Ireland family from way back very much unionist as well and they ran a post office in the village for many years in Stamullen and uh, the last of them who lived there, Sammy, was uh, unmarried and he ended his days in a, in a Catholic nunnery. He was a brilliant carpenter and he was looking after uh, the church and things for the, for the Catholic nuns in the poor Clare's children's home in Stamullen so Sammy ended his days there and his house fell into decay. It was on the way home from the national school, so bit by bit it started to decay with windows being broken and eventually when enough windows was being broken, it was broken into and much stuff was taken from it. Uh, furniture and fireplaces and Victorian fireplaces and bits and pieces. It was almost on the ground when permission had been given to erect two houses in its place back in the later 90s. So on its demolition, when there was hardly anything left in it, I went down with another man from Julianstown who was into his history and the bits and pieces that was left lying around within. Uh, there was a lot of music sheets that my friend Tom was interested in lying on the floor, but there was also hundreds if not thousands of invoices and receipts Many of these were tucked up on a kind of a coat hanger that had been driven through a piece of wood. And over a 10 year period in particular, from 1919 to 1929, was literally thousands of these invoices and receipts, each with a hole in it, each put down through the, the coat hanger. Uh, and they were from all over the place. They were from locally, from blacksmiths, farriers, stonemasons, shopkeepers. They were from as far away as England, where he had ordered, the family had ordered suits and sweets, and there was things coming in as well for the post office, having been collected on the trains at Garmanston, um, shops and businesses in Drogheda, and of course in Balbriggan. And there was several hundreds of them from Balbriggan. And when I brought them home and left them there for a while, and then was going through them, and the best thing about them was that their social history, everything was covered. No matter what this man bought, whether it was candles and matches, uh, lumps of beef, uh, uh, dog food, dog licenses, you name it, everything. So they built up a, a period of community history from 1919, so we're still under British rule, right through to 1929 into the Free State. And I noticed that many of them had carried a date of 1920 in relation to Balbriggan. So by and large, it was everything from the garages where he was buying his fuel to buying his daily products, his, his weekly groceries, 
everyone he was doing, doing a deal with, hardware stores, butchers, um, it was all there. And so some of these dates had dates running the whole way through 1920. And I thought, Jesus, this, this is interesting because it builds up a picture of how people lived um, by cross-referencing how much people were on on wages. Uh, you could build up a whole picture just based alone on these invoices as to how a family lived and how prices had even changed, particularly over that 10-year period. And it was also shown the businesses that existed in Balbriggan. And in fact, some of the invoices actually had carried a date right up to uh, today. Some of them were dated up to the 18th of September. And there is a lull when you go through it, like after it, that's 20 years ago or more. And when you go back to them over the likes of this, uh, again, there was something held here in 2016 in relation to the sacking of Balbriggan. And I remember taking them out at that time and looking at them again. And you can build up so much and you can see that there's actually a gap in them uh, where he obviously didn't come into Balbriggan for a few weeks for sure. It's the end of October into November when the receipts and invoices pick up again, for instance. So you can see that the last receipts stop on the 18th, which would have been on a Saturday, and hence the, he'd be coming in to do, get his weekly bits and pieces. Um, so based on that then, following on from that, uh, I was looking for information on the Sackable Brigand back then, and there, there was no books, maybe few if any, but many articles written on the actual occasion, the event that took place. And I remember then seeing a video, an old video that Jim Walsh, the, the great Jim Walsh had put together, and he had interviewed people, again, great community history, so you're getting, you're getting the memories of people who had lived through it uh, as they were children, or had heard stories passed down by their parents about what happened in Balbriggan. So you're not just relying here on documents. Uh, community history is strange, in the, especially where I take it in-depth, is to listen to people. Sometimes people's uh, accounts are equally as intriguing, if not more truthful sometimes, than no matter what's written. Just because it's written doesn't mean it isn't true. And yet, some historians are of the belief that if it's not written, they don't want to believe it because it's not written, so therefore there's no valid source for it. Uh, in community history, that's a very bad mistake to make, uh, because it's been proven time and time and time again that what people have got to say is always worth listening to, always, no matter how far back you go. It's strange the way oral history comes down, not just for the hundred years, which is a very short space in historical times, it's only a grandfather ago, but the likes of how far back oral history can go, of what people in communities know about areas, what they know about place names within townlands, so place names that have no addition to cartographers or for administration purposes, election purposes, uh, ecclesiastical reasons. So these place names within townlands, for instance, when the motorway was going through again 20 years ago, the likes of people telling archaeologists well in advance of the motorway being stripped, uh, field of the hidden cave, and 9th century suitorains were found in the field, never seen before, but yet it's in the, the people's memory, wherever it comes from, telling Professor O'Kelly that the sun lit up the passage tomb of Newgrange, for instance, seven years before he rebuilt the window box, the only way to allow the sun in, which had been collapsed for 4,000 years, and yet when he built up the window box, lo and behold, People down the know were telling them, we told you that already. And it's a strange thing about oral history, is that, especially in, in an Irish context, of how long it's been with us, a uh, couple of thousand years, but how, how often maybe we had to refer back to oral history and what the people know, because if they were found with certain types of documents, you could find yourself ending up on the end of a rope through different periods of our history. So it's well worth listening to locals and to get all angles of this type of history. So beginning with those invoices and receipts from back in the late 90s, from watching the original tape that Jim Walsh had recorded, and from listening to other people and delving into 
uh, articles and newspaper reports, uh, I began to bring something together. So what I'd done for, which was published in 2006, was based on those invoices that I found. So the Sackable Brigand booklet was published with part of a small heritage grant back in 2006. Uh, and it gives a, an overview as a community historian. I began to look up Albrigan from January of 1920 right up to the point of when uh, the tragic event happened on the 20th of September. And taking a look at all sources, and particularly the local press as well, sometimes the local press are kind of ignored, whereas the f when you go back to look at the reporters from the local regional press, particularly the Drogheda Independent, uh, the reporters really done a good job when they were at their work, not only in correction, spelling and grammar and everything, the way the paper was laid out and th the way the reporters went about getting their information. So after the events of September 1920, after the 20th of, November, of September 1920, sometimes you can get way far-fetched stories within newspapers, American newspapers, English newspapers, Australian newspapers, and some of them just like maybe made up stories after an event has taken place. And so you'd wonder sometimes when you read some, some stories far-fetched. But by and large, the regional newspapers, such as the Drogheda Independent, which in its day stretched from North Dublin, so from in around Malahide, Baldoyle area, as far over as Mullingar and as far down as Newry. So that kind of area is the area covered by a regional newspaper such as the Drogheda Independent. And they cover stories that you won't find in the National Archives or the National Library. So little things about maybe a house going on fire, somebody falling off a bike, some incident that might happen on the street. So some humorous incidents as well. And you get these type of little snippets within local and regional newspapers that you won't find anywhere else as a source of history, as in an archives, for instance. So you get documentation in, uh, in the archives, but you get really snippets, brilliant snippets of history contained within the local and uh, the regional newspapers. The same as the court cases, some of the court cases within the regional and local newspapers are actually brilliant to read. They're humorous because the journalist has been sitting within the court and he's listening to what's going on, but he writes down exactly even when people are crying, when they laugh and when the audience laughs, uh, when something goes wrong in the court. So it's when you go for the court record in the National Archives, you just get the, the actual record of what happened in the court, but you don't get the feeling of what happened. It's the journalist that will give you that in those old, uh, newspapers. So based on that kind of community history is how the booklet came about to be published in 2006. And it was interesting to note that beginning in January of that year, how Balbriggan was a thriving town. Uh, from the month of January, the meetings of the committees in Balbriggan and the Board of Guardians uh, the Rural District Council. They're looking for extra houses. They're looking for the boundaries of Balbriggan to be extended so that they could build more houses. There was a demand for more houses because of the, uh, the work that was going on in Balbriggan. Everybody was employed. There was at least seven, if not 800 people working in the hosiery factories. There was people working in in the fishing industry, local agriculture, local industries, uh, services, merchants, the shops, the hotels. Everything seemed to be going right for Balbriggan. Uh, wages were three pounds a week or more, which was a substantial amount in 1920. And the town itself, it just seemed to be thriving from January. There was a new loom house going to be built for uh, Smith's Hosiery Factory that eventually opened in July was to employ another 100 people. Uh, and there was a real community spirit. And again, you get that from the newspapers of the little snippets that's going on. 
about the, the weather conditions, about the banter that's going on, about the local Gaelic leagues, about the GAA matches, the sports days, the field days, the bright summer that they had, uh, the kind of uh, the, the, the wages, the holiday period, and it's given a town that's vibrant. It's given a reflection of a town that's really, really vibrant in the whole early part of uh, 1920. And then the hunger strikes that ended on mid-April, uh, there was national strikes called for on Tuesday and Wednesday, the 13th and 14th of April, because of the men who'd been in Mount Joy without trial. And there was national strikes all over the country, all over the country. shops were closed, and people went on the march for the release of these uh, men, there was over 100 of them. So on Wednesday, the 14th of April, those 100 men were released unconditionally from Mount Joy Prison. And of course, there were celebrations all across the country as a result. And Balbriggan was no exception. There was uh, a large group of people on that particular evening, the 14th of April, 1920, had walked up uh, early in the evening, six, seven o'clock, from the town up Clonard Street, up Clonard Hill, and had uh, brought a few drinks with them and songs and dance and whatever. Great celebration at the release of these uh, men from Mount Joy Prison. And of course, they probably many, maybe many men within that group thought that they were on a win-win situation here, that uh, we were on top of the situation. They were jeering the local RIC officers who accompanied them to keep an eye on them up to the top of the hill. One of them was Head Constable Hunter, based here in Balbriggan, as they all were, Sergeant Patrick Finnerty, uh, and two constables, one called Constable Shannon and the other called Constable McGill. So the four policemen went up to Clannard Hill to keep an eye on these celebrations. And of course, as the night wore on and began to, to get dark, uh, some of the crowd, uh, there, there was youths and women with them, they lit a bonfire threw sticks on the fire and lit the fire. And of course, they, they had a tricolour with them. And uh, Head Constable Hunter went and he, he asked one of the men, was, was this a, a Sinn Féin meeting? And of course, they, they refused to answer him. They jeered the policemen while they were there and they sang rebel songs and they stayed there, I think, until near midnight they decided then they'd walk back down into the town. So as they were walking back into the town, uh, Sergeant Finnerty was shot, and he was, sh he was shot in the back of the head, and he fell down on the street. The people kept walking. It's interesting that on one side, you get the report saying that as they were coming into Clannard Street, about 15 men in number fell back the crowd kept walking, and the policemen were behind this particular crowd. And as about 15 men fell back, two shots rang out, and one of them hit Sergeant Finnerty, and he fell to the ground. Uh, it said the people continued to walk, that they didn't hear the sound of the bullet or bullets. And uh, doctor, uh, the doctor was called for, and he came, and they attended to. Sergeant Finnerty on the street, and then he was removed to the Maher Hospital, where he died two days later. He died on the morning of uh, April the 16th, on the Friday morning. When you look at the witness statements, um, there's a man who puts his hands up in 1956 and says it was he who pulled the trigger. Uh, I think his name was Gaynor. And Gaynor said that uh, Sergeant Finnerty had tried to take the tricolour away from them on a number of occasions on top of Clannard Hill, and that somebody had told Gaynor, if he tries that again, we'll plug him. In other words, we'll shoot him. And 
Gaynor goes on to say in his witness statement that Finnerty was a bad one anyway, uh, and that he wasn't liked by any of the volunteers, and that he, he tried his best always to put them down and to go after the volunteers, and that he, was, he called them what he said was a bad one. The other side of that tale is when you look, I've seen that the newspaper reports after his death said that he was well respected in Balbriggan, he was well liked in Balbriggan, and that everyone had great time for him, particularly the poorer class, which he had helped an awful lot. The priest on the following Sunday morning in Balbriggan denounced those who, who shot him. And on looking at the report in the paper and seeing the witness statement, well then, the research was to look to see what I would call do a CSI on Sergeant Finnerty. In other words, some of these people should be just looked at more closely to see exactly who they were and what they did. So lift up Sergeant Finnerty, put him on the table and do a CSI on him. In other words, do a background research on him. And what you do find is by looking at the court cases back in the past, before April 1920, and where Sergeant Finnerty is in court, uh, it's exactly as the paper had reported. Really, really in with the people, speaking up for the people, speaking up for children. There was a bit of a, there was so much money floating around Balbriggan, by, by the looks of things, that uh, a drink played a role in, in, in some families, as it always does. And some kids were neglected as a result. Kids were being taken off people and put into industrial schools in Drogheda. Uh, and Sergeant Finnerty comes to the forefront an awful lot in speaking up for some of the mothers and of the poor children. Some of the children who wouldn't go to school uh, maybe lost a mother. Mother had died. Father couldn't keep a grip on them. And Finnerty was there to speak up for them. So there's a different story sometimes in one side and the other, saying that he was a bad one, and was he really a bad one? Anyway, that was things changed after that night when Sergeant Finnerty was was killed in Balbriggan, and it went downhill from 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 that. There was a lot more activity started to come together in Balbriggan. A lot of military activity, a lot of houses being raided and the military coming through it on a, a daily if not hourly basis on the way to and from Garmerson camp to uh, Dublin. So again on the, the night of the, the, the killing, on the lead up to the killing, uh, people had taken their summer holidays, kids were off school, weather reports was uh, brilliant so it looks like they had a good summer. Fishing reports were great, agricultural reports were great, the shifting of grain, the importation of merchandise to Balbriggan Harbour, the expansion of the factories, everything seemed to be going well and again the community seemed to be gelled together. A uh, lot of good humour in Balbriggan right up to the night of uh, Head Constable Bork then coming back from Dublin after being promoted to the district inspector position and as he pulls in then to of course Smith's public house uh, as we know the rest is history and I'm not here to speak about that there's others has already spoken about that and uh, I, I would not qualified enough to know exactly the ins and outs of what happened on that particular evening with uh, head constable uh, Bork and his brother who, who were shot in both shot Smith's pub but you'd ask yourself when looking at all that in the past and over the years and even though you, I'd written something back in 2006 14 years has gone since that time so an awful lot of things has changed even in them 14 years like for instance the the World Wide Web so it's a lot easier nowadays to research so I've been getting and picking up pieces of history since I was about 11 and travelling to Dublin on the train with a pencil and paper, going to the National Archives, even looking at the census. And it was always a problem. You'd be halfway home on the train and you'd say, Jesus, 
You'd have to go up again the next day or something. You'd forget something. You'd find something. You'd read. Nowadays, with all that information gathered over them years in documentation and bits and pieces over the years, it's, it's easier. It's brilliant today for anyone doing community history to sit in front of a computer and you have your old records and you have your new records. You have your new access right there in front of your face. The world has come into your sitting room for research purposes, college documents, and you can crisscross reference. You can really crisscross references now at a rapid speed. So you can begin to crisscross references between witness statements, one statement from the police, another statement from an RIC officer on his own, a blackened hand, a soldier, a witness statement from 1956 or 57, newspaper reports. Uh, articles and books that's been written before. So uh, the access to material today is way, way greater than any time in the past. And it's easier not just to gain information, but to, to look at that information again from a new perspective, because so much is there in front of you. So you can say, Gee, hold on a minute. That's not what it says. And, and really, by moving this really quickly, you can have information in front of your face that this one statement disputes something else, or one article discounts some other purpose of information that has been written, and you can get your hands onto it. So, the, the, the community historian, again, is always qu to question everything. Who said it? Who done it? When did they do it? Why did they do it? Where was it done? For what reason? And there's always more questions, always, always, always. You're building up a jigsaw puzzle that'll never ever be finished. So you can only get snatches of history, a glimpse, and that glimpse goes down onto the CSI table. Then it fits, it's a fluid jigsaw. And eventually it fits into a piece where you can begin to see a bigger picture, but never the full picture, never. And particularly when you're dealing with such an incident or an event or a period as a war of independence followed by a civil war like what happened here in Balbriggan uh, because it's dirty and you'd often wonder what is the truth what's the real truth of this of what lies behind this who made decisions when and for what reason so you will never get the truth in in a guerrilla warfare Never. You might get near enough to it, and it depends on who's behind it and who releases statements or who said what and when did they say it and for what reason. Hence the witness statements. A generation, if not and more, beyond the actual period of when it happened. So an event that happened in 1920, people are writing about it in 1956, 57, 58 and 59, almost 40 years after the event. That's a generation. A generation is missing between 1920 and 1956. Whole generation gone. And in Drogheda, in the past, working at Millmount, uh, was, I, I done some of that in the past few years, over looking at people, again, witness statements, people who had written witness statements in the 1950s, and the actual facts of the matter not being anywhere near what was written. The, the other sources which completely discount what was written in 1956. Uh, and, and that happened more than once, where there were, there were downright falsehoods uh, coming from one side, if not both. And so again, you, you're, you're in a quagmire here of who said what, when did they say it, and for what reason did they say the likes of this. So when you look at Balbriggan, is why why did, uh, why Balbriggan, after Head Constable Burke was shot? Uh, and it was circumstance, maybe. So you go back to the beginning and have a look at Balbriggan. So Balbriggan was founded in the, in the mid 18th century, 1750, 1760. You're coming into the period of, you're in the Georgian period, but you're coming into the period of George the Third around 1759, 1760, 1763. Baron Hamilton builds the new pier here in the harbour at Balbriggan. Before that, 
Balbriggan, it wasn't even a village. It was, it was a, a, a bundle of mud cabins spread into the low hills within the valley of the Bracken River. That's all it is. At the time of the civil survey in the, in the later 17th century, after Cromwell, there's nothing here in Balbriggan. There's, there's a few mud cabins scattered about the place. The nearest village, which was substantial enough, was New Haven Bay, which is out on the coast. So between here and Garmanstown, out on the coast at Braymore, you had New Haven Village and New Haven Bay. At the time of Oliver Cromwell, there was 25 houses out there. So there could have been about 100 people or more living out at New Haven. The remains of the harbour that's still out there. And it's, it's even recorded in the Drogheda Corporation documents where they were still operating at New Haven Bay in 1734 um, because they're given out about it, the customs not being paid with stuff being dropped at New Haven rather than coming up the Bayern River where they'd have to pay a tax on it in the town of Drogheda. So there is mention of New Haven Bay right up to 1734. And at that time, this Balbriggan is only, it's, it's only a tart in someone's head. Then comes the harbour. And by within a few years, so the, the Balbriggan at the time of the Black and Tan sacking was only about 150 years old. That is really young for a town, even for a village, it's really young. Everywhere else around it had been in existence for Yonks. Scaries is probably an 18th century town, you know, by the wide streets, it's not medieval, the streets are too wide. But every other village around the area from Valbriggan, Valrothery, Manawar, Dalahasey, Nall, into County Mead to Clonalvi, Ardcat, the village where I come from, Stamullen, Garmanstown, in County Mead. Everywhere surrounding Balbriggan, it grew up organically. People been there for yonks, millennia. They're from there, they're from the earth of the place. Balbriggan, on the other hand, was new, young, vibrant, mid 18th century, huge changes coming about at that period. New line roads were ordered by the British government. Coach routes began to only emerge from the 1780s. Roads had to run as straight as they could from town to city, city to town, village to town. These were all new orders in, under the period of George III. It was a complete new era. It was a Celtic tiger period of the day. Uh, new roads were constructed. New maps had to go along with that because there was new coach routes. So the new, one of the new coach routes was the road to come. The old road, of course, as we know, would have torn that uh, to go across Clenard. So there wasn't even a road through here at the time. And you get the old coach route, which went across from Manowar to Balrothery to Clonard, down through the Fingal, across the Delvin River and into Garmanson and County Mead. And suddenly these new line roads under the, again, the later 18th century, the trustees of the Turnpike Commission, uh, who were building these roads and building uh, toll gates, at the time, were putting in these new stretches of roads. And as a result, Balbriggan is founded at the same time. So you've got these new coach routes, new map being produced in 1777 by Taylor and Skinner. And that map shows Balbriggan in its infancy. And here you have a village now that's starting to expand, starting to grow, but still new. And you've got a new coach route which is coming down through it, built in different stages. Knocknagin Bridge over the Delvin River, and then the stretch from Knocknagin to the Cock Tavern didn't exist at that time. So the road went up, Leg Dury, and then again through Garmerson Village. And eventually it was built from Knocknagin Bridge, the county bridge, right to the whole way to the Cock Tavern, where the road went down, which now today would be Garmerson Camp, and out at Richardstown. And then eventually they built a road from the Cock of Garmanstown down to Richardstown, the R132, which we know today. 
and the older road, which eventually part of became Garmerson Army Camp. So this, this whole place, in, 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 this whole town of Balbriggan was new and grew up from the period of the later 18th century. So it was about 100, 150 years old at the time of the sacking of Balbriggan. By the early 1820s, of course, there's a, the, the harbour has been, new harbour has been sunk and deepened. Um, it's been extended, the pier in the harbour here in Balbriggan has been extended. 1844, the railway comes. By 1852-53, there's meetings being held in Drogheda about putting a lighthouse on the Rockabill, and that takes place unanimously passed and it's built and it opens in seven, or 1859. And Griffith's valuation, when Samuel Lewis, his topographical history of Ireland, and he talks about Balbriggan and it's thriving in 1837, it's surely thriving again in Griffith's valuation. You can see the amount of businesses and the amount of people, families that are still here today, can clearly see all the families that's already now living in Balbriggan. So it was from its infancy, which is later 18th century, a new town, from its infancy it, it was building, building up all the time, progressing, expanding, right through the 19th century and right through into the 20th century. Nobody in Balbriggan, people were using Balbriggan at the time of the 1798 rebellion. There was being, there was there was, there's references to people having meetings in particular public houses in Balbriggan and about the assassination, assassination of a French boy out in the training ground in the Nall uh, and the, the information has been picked up in public houses here in Balbriggan. So as the town of Balbriggan expanded and grew up from the later 18th century, so too did the older villages, as I've mentioned before, from Manowar the whole way across to uh, Denal, out into County Mead, Denal, Villard, Katz, the Mull and Garmerson. As the new town grew and expanded with commercialisation and merchants and industry and coal imports, so too did these villagers begin to come in to do their weekly shopping. This was a new town, easy to get to, horse and cart. So it, it was the main town for the outlying villages. And in 1916, Although there was people in these outlying villages, and particularly over in Ashbourne and out in County Mead, who got involved in 1916 and fought with Thomas Ash, some women, especially even Molly Adrian from McNanstown House in Stamullen, who was also involved in 1916. And so these people in the outlying villages were also familiar with everyone who lived in Balbriggan and vice versa. That's why. Uh, and then coming through the decades and into the 20th century, people were very familiar with coming in and out of Balbriggan. And after 1916, in 1917, um, the volunteers would have been formed here in Balbriggan. And it's interesting again to see the local newspapers when the meetings are called for the volunteers to meet here in Balbriggan on particular Sundays of the representatives that come also from these outlying villages to join the Finn Gaul Brigade. Dozens of them, absolutely dozens of them join, including from Stamullen, who were part of the Finn Gaul Brigade. Further north, Julianstown, Bellistown, kind of South Loud Brigade, but Clanalvi, Denal, Stamullen, Garmerson, Balrothery, all flocking in to Balbriggan, so the logistics of places being born, barracks, coast guard stations, RIC stations, uh, raids on farmyards to pick up weapons, guns, the logistics of what was happening around the place. There was no huge battle between, say, Republican forces and military forces, but it was much bigger than that. The, the logistics of picking weapons up, moving weapons, moving people, hiding weapons, hiding people, hiding money, collecting money, uh, was huge in, in this whole area of East Mead and uh, North County Dublin at the time. And so what you have is, it wasn't just us 
against them either, in the sense that it was the Irish against the English and this was the War of Independence. There was also uh, out from the Black and Tans, the RIC, uh, British soldiers, whatever, 1916. You had many people living in these outlying villages and within towns of Balbriggan who were dead set against what was happening with Republican forces. They were quite happy living under British rule. In fact, some of them wanted to be under it no matter what. They were unionist way of thinking and they were loyal to the crown and king of England. And on the other side of it, you had people from within the military sections. There was one of them that I looked at a while ago where there was a post office worker in County Mead in, in the town of Navan, a man originally from Tyrone. His name was Thomas Hodgett. And Thomas Hodgett was taken from his house in February 1921 by two men who called to his door late at night, told his wife first that they were black and tans, and then they told her that, they, they said to her, they gave an impression they were black and tans, but then they told her that they were Republicans. But she had said later that she had sworn that they were, one of them had a touch of an English accent, and that he was trying to put on an Irish accent. And they called to her house looking for her, post ma her postmaster husband, and they took him away. And he was found several weeks later on the Good Friday in uh, the, the, the Blackwater River in Navan, where he had again had been shot in the back of the head. And the story was put out that it was the IRA, but his wife, from the very first instance, who had written letters to Churchill and even the King of England, along with the military forces headquarters here in Dublin, who she sent a, a letter to, she said it certainly was not. Anyway, there was an inquiry into this about who may have killed Thomas Hodgett, and the, the, no one was ever convicted, but the people who were responsible, including uh, Thomas Hodgett's wife, had no doubt in who was responsible were two brothers. One of them was a district inspector of County Mead, and the other was a county inspector. Meredith and Arthur Egan was the name. One of them was born in Tullamore, the other born in Galway. The father was also an ex-RIC officer, and Arthur Egan had spent three years in the British Army. But they were travelling around County Mead. They were also, one of those Egans was also involved in the murder of Thomas Halpin and Moran in Drogheda uh, in March of 1921. And several witness, witnesses gave statements after Thomas Hodgett was killed in Navan, including an RIC man. Uh, there were several wit witness statements but when you get these witness statements again, CSI, put them all up on the table, have a look, cross-reference them. There's one thing about these partic this particular incident in Navan is that the statements all start to make sense and they do link into one another. And on more than one occasion, there's a reference given to the Englishman who was with them. So they had a driver and the two Egans and there was another man with them in the car and his name was Munro, and Munro was a, a, a black and tan officer who was based in Garmonston camp. So you get these people who are on both sides, who are not quite what, what they seem to be. In other words, that law and order wasn't kept all the time down the straight and narrow by some of these forces. On the other side, that you get people who are involved in the volunteer movement, and they are also up to their neck in other activity, such as in different parts of the country. So, for instance, in parts of County Mead, you had a gang called the Black Hand Gang, and the Black Hand Gang were operating around Navan, Trim, down as far as Oldcastle, and they were made up a bunch of ex-soldiers, ex 
RIC officers, prisoners, ex-IRB members, and what they literally were doing was putting Protestant people out of their homes and off their land during the same period. They were renegades from any Republican group, and they were taking pot shots at people, women who were out hanging clothes on the line, farmers who were in the fields, because they wanted them off the land. They were operating totally independent of anyone else. Ruthless is what they were. And Sean Boylan, the Mead great football, Gaelic football Mead manager, his father, who was the commanding officer in County Mead, had a meeting with his men and made an order to go round. They, they, they robbed a lorry someplace, uh, Sean Boylan. They had it stored in Dunboyan. And one particular evening, they knew who they were picking up. And they picked up a number of these red or uh, black hand gang. And they brought it to Dunboyan for questioning. One of them, who was an ex-British army officer, was the only one that they executed. And they told him why they were executing him. He was the leader of them. But they executed him. They shot him dead in Dunboyan. The rest of them were brought, he said, to Holt and to the pier in Drogheda, where they were placed on board and told never to return. So in the model of what happened during the period of 1920 and what happened here in Balbriggan, you've got people on both sides. It wasn't just us against them. There were people living in the communities. And one of them who needs more investigation, there's one of them has popped up in the area of East Mead. And he's an interesting character. And he's doing business. He's a, a businessman in East Mead. He's of the Unionist uh, persuasion. And I found out a lot about him in the last number of years, but he, he's, he, he's a funny type of a character. He's, he's moving in and out of different places, including Garmus and Camp. And he's moving in and out of places of known, later on known anyway, that they were Republicans and that they were active Republicans in the East Mead and Fingal area, hence the likes of Dan Brian being around the area so much, as can be seen in his book by Fight for Irish Freedom, as who he was staying with in the Nall, in Julianstown, in Garmanstown, and the people who were leaving Dan Brian back into Dublin. So it, it's, it's really interesting to what we see the witness statements then being written much later after an event as to how true are the actual witness statements. So just by finishing up on this today, why Balbriggan and what I said about Balbriggan in its infancy in the 18th century and how it was formed due to the new roads and the major changes of the new machine age which became the Industrial Revolution, hence the building of the factories in Balbriggan in the later 18th century. Why Balbriggan? Maybe but Brigham was a victim of its own existence. Location, location, location. When the Black and Tans and RIC were in Garmanson, going to and from the camp, it was an easy place to stop off, especially on your way back. So on your way back from Dublin, they would tend to be driving through Balbriggan sometimes shouting abuse out, particularly after the event, going through even into October, November 1920. But coming back from Dublin, they were safe once they got to Balbriggan. They weren't going to stop off maybe in Swords. And they weren't going to start coming into places like Swords and demand things from shops and not pay for them. The abuse people on the street, go in and then, as they were called, the drink mad savages. But they could get away with it in Balbriggan because they were almost on the verge of on their own doorstep. They knew once they got into the crossly tender lorries that they were home. As soon as they went up Coney Hill, they were home. They were in the camp and they knew that. And that's why the same Drahada was not en route from the camp. So Balbriggan was its location, being here, was when they left the camp. They always had to come through Balbriggan. They weren't going to use the older road, the older coach route, out through Clonard and bypass Balbriggan because it was running through dangerous countryside in 1920. Too many bridges, too many outlying farmsteads, too many valleys, 
places in the way where they could be a pop shot at them. So they were tending to use the new road, the big road, the wide road, coming through Balbriggan. And so on the way home, it was an easy place to stop, to have drinks, to come in, not pay for whatever, get the drinks, get drunk, rob people, which they did, which the paper's full of them. And then arrive back home, it was almost like just falling out the door, and they were back home. So if Balbriggan was a person, to use a well-known phrase, that they were a vic it was a victim of its own existence to be here as the location where Balbriggan actually was uh, was the reason why what took place in September the 20th of September of 1920 was because of the location of these black and tans actually coming through it. So I'd like to just finish on that. Thank you very much. Thank you.